Good morning, Eastside family and friends. It's good to be with you once again. Want to send greetings from Debbie and Lisa and my dad. And my dad, by the way, is doing much better. He's making an amazing recovery from his cracked hip. So we're very, very thankful for that. Once again, I'd like to thank Troy and David, Bill, Greg, and Bob for the good job they're doing putting putting on this uh, production and making it possible for us to worship together and, and to study God's word together. We're going to continue today in the book of 1 Peter, and I'd like to invite you all to follow along in your own Bibles if you would like to. Uh, let's, let's begin by reading the section of scripture we're going to look at this morning. And that's found in 1 Peter, <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 9 through 17. So beginning in verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men, Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Okay, let's uh, go back to verse 9. <clears throat> Last week we ended the class by discussing people who had rejected the living stone, which was Jesus and had stumbled over it because they were disobedient to the word of God. This week we are, are going to begin by looking at a much different group of people, Christians, who have been obedient to the word of God and who have accepted the living stone as their savior. So he says here, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. All of these terms are quotations from the Old Testament where God is describing his people, the Israelites, and his relationship to those people. And, and Peter applies those to us as Christians. I'll read a couple of the examples from the Old Testament that this comes from. Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you are more in number than any of the peoples, for you are the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers. And in Exodus 19, 5 through 6, he writes, <clears throat> Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So these were his chosen people in the Old Testament, and now he's saying that we are a chosen race. 
We've uh, discussed the word chosen in, a, in our first lesson in 1 Peter, and, and it means that God chose us. He wants us to be part of his family. And what a wonderful thing that is, that, that the God of the universe, the King of kings, wants us to be part of his family. And we're a chosen race, not, a ra not based on genetics or skin color or our ancestry, but we're a race of people because of, of what's in our hearts, because of our loyalty to God and, and our acceptance of his son as our savior and, heart, and our obedience to the word of God. All of these make us a special people, different than the, than the rest of the people on earth. Uh, he tells us that we are a royal priesthood uh, last week we looked at the the idea that we were a holy priesthood and uh, we are priests in the sense that we have direct access to God now. We don't have to go through someone else to have access to God. And we're able, the book of Hebrews tells us that we can now enter the holy place through the blood of Christ, which was reserved for priests in the Old Testament. And also that we offer up spiritual sacrifices to God. We don't offer up animal sacrifices anymore, but we now offer up spiritual sacrifices. And last week we looked at some examples in the New Testament of what those sacrifices were, doing good and offering praises to God. And I think here he says that we're a royal priesthood because we're priests of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords of the universe. That's a, a high honor that we have. The next description he, he gives of us is that we are a holy nation. God wants us to be a holy people because he's holy and he loves what is holy and good and righteous. Um, uh, in Psalm 5, David writes this, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells in you. So God hates evil, but he loves righteousness and goodness, and, and that's the kind of people he wants us to be. And another passage that uh, speaks to this is found in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Those are the things that please the Lord, justice, kindness, and humbleness. Uh, that, that passage always reminds me of Arthur Graham. Many of you knew him. He always quoted that when he led prayers on Sunday mornings. But imagine a world in which all of the people are holy. It would be a much different world than we live in. Imagine a place where the inhabitants practiced, all the inhabitants practiced justice and kindness and humility. There would no longer be a need for locks or jails, security systems, armies, police, weapons, lawsuits, fights, murders. All of those things would would not be needed anymore because everyone in this world would be holy. And uh, that reminds me of a song that John Lennon made popular, and I guess he wrote the song called Imagine. And he's, he's imagining a world like that. But that world is never going to come to pass in this present world. Um, there's always going to be evil. The The Bible says that there will always be wars and rumors of wars. But, but that is the world that we will live in in the next life. It's going to be filled with holy people. 
And just, just think how great that's going to be. Continuing on in verse 9, he says, So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He says that so that we can proclaim the excellencies of him. Uh, after all the things that we've looked at in the book of 1 Peter, all of the blessings that he's showered on us and all the wonderful things that he's done for us, it shouldn't be hard for us to think of excellent things that he has done to praise him for. And that's our duty. That's one of our duties as Christians is to praise God and to thank him. Last week, we, we looked at Hebrews 13 as one of those spiritual sacrifices, and I'll read that again because it talks about this praise. Through Hebrews 13, 15, Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. Let's be a thankful people that praise him in, uh, to those around us. This idea that he has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. If you study the Bible, the, the terms darkness and light, um, there's a stark contrast in what they symbolize in, in the Bible. Uh, light symbolizes God and his angels and Christ. Darkness symbolizes Satan and the demons Light symbolizes truth and knowledge. Darkness symbolizes ignorance and lies. Lightness, the light symbolizes goodness. The darkness symbolizes evil. Um, righteousness and unrighteousness. Dark, or light symbolizes love and darkness symbolizes hate. Let's read a few scriptures that, that talk about darkness and light. And, and let's look at the contrast. First of all, we'll look at 1 John 1, 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And further on in 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, he says, The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brothers in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Colossians 1.13 tells us that he has rescued us from the domain of darkness. Ephesians 5.11 tells us not to participate in the fruitless deeds of darkness. And Ephesians 6.12, in the passage where he's talking about our battle against the evil forces, he talks about the powers of this dark world are one of our opponents that we need help fighting against. So the realm of darkness is filled with sin and hate and demons and Satan and all of the unrighteous. But the kingdom of light is filled with righteousness and love and holiness and the Lord God and his son Jesus Christ. Which of those two places do you think you would like to spend eternity? I know which one I would. Uh, verse 10, For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is a, a quotation from the book of Hosea. And you might remember the story of Hosea. God instructed 
Hosea to take an adulterous woman as a wife. And they had children together, and God instructed him to name each of those children a name which illustrated something about the <clears throat> people of Israel, something bad about the people of Israel. And their third child they named Lo-Ami, which uh, means you are not my people, and I am not your God. But later in chapter 2 of the book of Hosea, he, he prophesies about a time to come when he will restore the, the nation of Israel. And at that point he says, I will also have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. So at one time they were not his people, but he restored them, and once again they were his people. And, th and that applies to us as Gentiles. At one time the Gentiles were not God's people, but now we are God's people. So what a great blessing that is. Verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. What does being aliens and strangers have to do with abstaining from fleshly lusts? <clears throat> well, I think uh, Philippians 3, 18, and 18 through 20 is a good explanation of that. Paul writes, for many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ." Now notice in that passage that he says when you set your mind on earthly things that, that you're following your own appetites and your enemies of the cross of Christ. In other words, you're following your fleshly desires and lusts. But he tells us that our citizenship is in heaven, not on earth. And so, so when he says that we're aliens and strangers... He means that we're living in a foreign country. This is just a temporary place that we're passing through to get to our heavenly uh, country that we're going to live in eternally. And he's warning us that while we live here in this, in this earthly country, we aren't to join the rest of the people on earth in following their own appetites and their own lusts. We're supposed to be different. And he tells us that these fleshly lusts wage war against our souls. Uh, Paul writes in Galatians 5 that the flesh sets its desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another. So there's a battle going on between the spirit and the flesh, and Satan is trying to use our fleshly desires to drive a wedge between us and God. He wants to destroy us, but God will help us. He's promised that he will protect us if we keep our faith in him and resist Satan. Verse 12 tells us, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. This is one of two verses in, these, in this section we're looking at today that is concerned with our setting a good example to the Gentiles or the pagans. He uses those terms to refer to non-Christians. Anyone who isn't a follower of God is a, a pagan. And uh, we, we want to set a good example for them. And it says that they will, even though they slander us now, at, at some time in the future, on the day of visitation, they're going to glorify God. There's a little difference of opinion on what that day of visitation is. 
but I think it's referring to the day of judgment when we all stand before God. Even the enemies of God are going to glorify God on that day. And uh, as we see in Matthew 14, 10 through 12, Jesus says, But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Notice that everyone is going to be bowing for, before God and praising God. That includes even the enemies of God. And so if we set a good example, even though on earth we get slandered by our enemies, on that day they're going to praise God because of, of how we acted, if, if we act in the right way. Okay, at, at this point in our lesson, we, we uh, switch to a different subject, the subject of our relationship to our earthly governments. And uh, this is a very relevant and timely topic, uh, considering what we're going through now in, in the world. And uh, so let's, let's take a look at how we're supposed to relate to our human governments. Verse 13 through 15 says, Submit yourself, yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. He tells us we're supposed to submit to the governing authorities. That's something that a lot of people at this time don't want to do. That There's a state of rebellion among many people at this time. And we must admit that our government is not perfect and that it's done some horrid things in the past. But Peter wrote this under the Roman government. And I don't think any government that we've had is worse than the Roman government for cruelty and injustice. So if he tells us to submit to the Roman government, then we surely ought to submit to the government that we're under. And, and there's a lot of issues that, that are going on now that we need to think about how we submit to the government. Um, he tells us, for one thing, that it's the will of God that we submit to the government. And uh, there's a parallel passage in Romans chapter 13, 1 through 7, that gives a little more detail. I won't read that, but some of the things it tells us is that all authority is from God, and those that exist are established by God. Whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and the authority is a minister of God for good. Rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to the collection of taxes. So it's pretty plain from Romans that, that God institutes these governments. And, and they're not perfect. And, they, and there are evil men who come to power and evil people who have done a lot of bad in the world. But... But as long as the government isn't ordering us to do something contrary to what God has commanded us to do, I think we're supposed to submit to them. And each of these issues that we face, we need to ask ourselves, is this in line with what God wants? Um, it, do we have a reason for rebelling against the government? Uh, let's let's look at a few of those issues. The government wants us to stay home at this time to slow the spread of the coronavirus. I don't think that violates any of God's commandments, so we should we should obey that. Um, we're not allowed to assemble in large groups as a church. 
Uh, some churches have thought that this is contrary to God's commands of assembling, but I don't think so. We can still assemble in small groups. We can meet on, on the computer like we're doing here. Um, we can still worship. We can still fellowship. And so I think that we need to submit to their uh, rule to not assemble in large groups to try to slow down this virus. Wearing masks in public places. That may be annoying, but, but I think we can put up with it if the government has ordered that we do that. Uh, the government has instituted some curfews to try to um, cut down on the destruction and rioting that had been going on. I, need, I think we need to honor that. Demonstrations. Now, under our government, it is legal to demonstrate and to express our displeasure if we think the government is doing something unjust. And so as long as that's allowed, I, I think we as Christians can, can participate in that. But as far as uh, riots, uh, destruction of property and violence, uh, all of those are against the law and those are against God's law also. So I, I think that it would be wrong for us as Christians to participate in that kind of activity. Okay, verse 16. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. We are free men or free people in the sense that we are no longer under the, the Old Testament covenant. Uh, Paul makes it clear in the book of Romans that under that law, we were doomed because none of us could keep that law. And, and uh, Jesus came and died for us and he freed us from that law. And so in that sense, we're free men. But he's telling us not to use that freedom as a, a covering to do evil things. We're still voluntarily making ourselves bond slaves of God. We want to do the will of God. And so we want to behave in, uh, in the right manner. Finally, uh, verse 17. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. I don't think any of us have trouble with the, the command here to love the brotherhood. We need to love our brothers and sisters. We need to uh, do everything we can to help them and to share and, and to support them and encourage them. And I don't think any of us have a, a problem with the command to fear God. We, we've spoken in past lessons how part of our relationship to God involves fear because he's a God that, that we need to have awe and respect for because of who he is and for his power. But we also love him in, in, in the same, at the same time. But I think some of us might have trouble with this command to honor the king we don't have a king, but we do have a president, and we have senators and congressmen. And politics is kind of a hot-button issue in, in America today. There's a lot of uh, divisiveness and, and disagreement over politics, and, and a lot of times our emotions get worked up. And, and I think there are a lot of people in the, in the United States that hate our president. And, uh, and there's a lot of people on the other side who hate our former president. Um, our politics have, have gotten so strong, but, but I think there's no room for that in our lives as Christians. Whoever is in power, God has put him there for a purpose, and we need to show that person honor and respect. And I, I think... We don't have to agree with everything they do, but we need to be respectful in the way that we voice our disagreement and in the way we 
approach other people about, about those differences in our opinions. Well, that, that concludes our lesson for today. Next week, we'll take up in 1 Peter 2 and verse 18 and uh, finish the chapter next week. So uh, hope, hopefully we've covered a few things that cause us to think and, and uh, help us to be better servants of God.